Hi, welcome to Edward Box Guitar Tuition. So I have the first classic album inspection here of uh, 2022 for you. So this year I'll be celebrating albums, 50 year anniversaries of albums that came out in 1972, 45 year anniversaries of albums that came out in 1977, 40th anniversaries for 1982, 35th anniversaries for 1987 and 30th anniversaries for 1992. And maybe we'll do something from 2002 as well, have a very young anniversary. Um, uh, so as usual, share and subscribe if you're interested in this. You can say I've changed location and I've changed my hat so we know what year it is. Uh, keep things more interesting. I'll have to pick somewhere else when we do the next batch of these. But um, the album we'll look at today, I've got to confess, I'm not sure when it came out. I tried to look for a release date. All I know it was released in 87. Some places say it was 86. But I'm pretty certain uh, we got this in Europe, certainly in early 87. I can seem to remember listening to it in the winter months. So I'm thinking February. I've got a kind of half term of school vibe, February. But I'm just putting out here uh, today, um, January the 1st, New Year's Day. Uh, so it's virtually coming up for uh, 35 years old. This is back front, but it's Malice's sophomore album, Licence to Kill. Quite a cool cover. Oh, this is the Rock Candy remaster. Um, so prior to this, Malice got quite a bit of traction in the UK, a lot of coverage with their debut album. In the beginning, they'd um, done a demo and been on the Metal, Metal Massacre EP, I think, uh, through Metal Blade Records. And they were, they were known around LA and one of those bands that were kind of hot on the LA circuit. Um, but it just took a while for kind of things to get going for them. Uh, I think the In The Beginning album kind of came out in the kind of middle, you know, it was after the Quiet Riot thing had been big and the Rat, Motley Crue and sort of before Dokken got kind of bigger. Um, uh, and I think the production let it down. Um, it was produced, there was the Michael Wagner demos that were pretty good, uh, but then Ashley Howe produced the, the other tracks they did on that album. Uh, he's not, um, you know, he's not the best metal producer. No offence, Ashley. He's like, you're right, he was good, um, uh, a, bon a bonanog. Um, so that album, you know, it had a kind of slightly sludgy sound, particularly on the guitars on some tracks, but the, the songs are good. That album's more consistent than this album we're going to talk about. Um, there's other things about this album are better. Um, but I mean, it did have a great cover. Um, uh, and I think Malice had that kind of Judas Priest lever image, which was maybe a little too aggressive for the US market in some ways. But they, they, were, well, they were pretty shamelessly like a Judas Priest type of band. Um, Cliff Carruthers on drums, Mark Bean on bass, uh, twin guitars and Mick Zane and Jay Reynolds and James Neal on vocals. James Reynolds, Jay Reynolds was very much the kind of mouthpiece focal point of the band. He had long blonde hair like K.K. Downing. Um, and the songwriting on this album, James Neal co-writes pretty much every track apart from the title tracks. He obviously does the lyrics and melodies. And then the music tends to be split between James J. Reynolds writing with James Neal or Mick Zane writing with Mark Bean alongside James Neal. And Mick Zane writes a little more. So of the two guitarists, uh, Mick Zane's the, 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 the good soloist on this. Uh, J. Reynolds is okay. Um, he does less solos than Mick Zane. Mick Zane uh, doesn't have a strong vibrato, but it's okay. But he crafts really good solos that, that make sense. Uh, J. Reynolds' riffs tend to be a bit more straight ahead, but Mick Zane's got some pretty cool riffs which we'll come to. Uh, James Neal, his vocal style, he does high screams. Uh, his look is quite funny. Imagine if Jack Nicholson decided to grow his hair long, was feeling on top of it, and decided to sing heavy metal. That's what he looks like. But anyway, so this album, Licence to Kill, um, they got Max Norman in to produce it, and he does a great job. Um, so Max Norman's in a real purple patch here. Um, I, th I think... Not so much the Aussie stuff, but starting with uh, Loudness, Thunder and East. When he's got good players, uh, he can capture a great sound. So Loudness, Thunder and East and Lightning Strikes 85, 86. Is this album 87? He does Friction by Coney Hatch. That's an album we might look at later on, uh, which I think's got a great sound. Um, of a little bombastic. Uh, then, of course, he does Wicked Sensation by Lynch Mob. And the 99 is a real watershed year for him because he does Rust in Peace by Megadeth. And then he has his string of Megadeth albums and his, his biggest success. Um, but this track, uh, sorry, this album, pardon me, opens with Sinister Double. So this is a really cool track, uh, it's 12 8 metre. Um, uh, you know, it's got a good mysterious melody by uh, James Neal, uh, quite a cool lyric um, about doppelgangers, stuff like that, uh, and good Mick Zane solo. Uh, 
the drums, you know, the production, not any one instrument stands out. I would say he's pushed the guitars, Mac Nol Max Nolan. I'd say James Neal's vocals, a little something to mix, but he's got quite a big reverb on him. Uh, supposed to kind of sync it and blend. Uh, you know, the drums are punchy, but it doesn't necessarily favour one instrument over the other. Uh, it's it's quite a balanced mix. Um, so it's a lot more commercially. It's heavy, but it's he's kind of he's polished it up, but in a good way. Um, and this is it's a, re a really good sounding record. Track two is the title track, "License to Kill." So this is written solely by Jay Reynolds. I love this track. This is the, probably the most LA metal track. It's probably why I like it. So it's got a the, the riff basically uses your classic dyads on the D and G. Um, it's the kind of riff that Rat might do or Dokken or any of those bands. So it's quite hair metal, um, but it's got a hilarious lyric uh, and a great gang chorus. Actually, a lot of the gang vocals on this is Dave Ellison. Uh, did some gang vocals. Um, who else was there? Tommy Thayer um, of Black and Blue. Uh, some other guys. I can't remember on the the, the, the sleeve notes there. But um, I think Max and Norman got some people in. Um, uh, I think James Neal said in interviews, vocals generally went down in one or two takes, but sometimes he took longer because Max and Norman was perfectionist. And I think that's Max Norman's thing. He basically gets really good performances in the band, but he doesn't overproduce. There's nothing massively extra on this track it's two rhythm guitars bass drums guitar solo lead vocals and some gang vocals but very well done so i love this track really cool if it's still one of my favorite riffs to play and when i first heard it, i loved it when you hear the isolated rhythm guitar on this you can hear there's not much gain on it um uh, and it's it's tight but it hasn't got that punch that say akira takasaki or lynch or you know, uh, one of those type of players would get. Um, but I think Max Norman's, you know, he's kind of disguised that well in the mix that maybe maybe the rhythm's not quite as punchy the attack as another player might be. Track freeze against the Empire. This is more, most heavy tracks so far, more full on metal. Um, it's kind of, uh, Malice did a lot of sci-fi lyrics. Had a song called Stellar Masters on the first album and No Haven for the Raven. And it's more kind of horror gothic, I suppose. Air attacks a bit, um, bit sci-fi so this track's not as good as the other two but i do like it it's easy a good six seven out of ten track uh then the original side one finished with vigilante um this has got a cool descending riff it's kind of more mean and moody um it's got a great solo in this mick zane really crafts um really builds melodically and he does a lovely little arpeggio bit again nothing technic really technical you know if i was picking a kind of technical level for mick zane's style of soloing he's in this sort of kk down in glen tipton Maybe more KK, um, you know, you can hear probably bits of Michael Schenker and, you know, of LA guitarists, but he's, he's, he's tasteful, he's, he's a guitarist who knows his limits, I think. Um, uh, he knows his limits, he knows what works well for him and works really hard at making uh, that happen for him. And he, he, he succeeds Amarillo on this album. Uh, I think Jay Reynolds probably did the license to kill, so which is a decent break. So side two opens with a Jay Reynolds, James Neal composition, Chain Gang Woman. I'm not sure what a Chain Gang Woman is. Obviously, if you're in a prison on a Chain Gang, you probably wouldn't be with women, unless it's a woman who's washing a car uh, and you're on the Chain Gang. It's like Cool Hand Luke, I don't know. But anyway, th this is quite a fun track. It's got a cool, cool riffing. Um, uh, it's pretty heavy. Uh, again, probably not as strong as the previous tracks before, but I do like it. It's, it's one of the best produced tracks. The rhythm guitar is really good on this. Uh, tracks uh, six and seven are the ones that drop the level of the album. You've got Christine, which is about the car, the film, so a horror lyric. And then there's Murder, which goes, Murder with Malice. Um, I should say James Neal does some really cool high screams on this. He's got quite a reedy voice, but it works. Uh, he's kind of melodic, but a bit sinister. But um, yeah, Christine and Murder, these tracks, they don't, don't really happen. I think what I was saying before, this is where the In the Beginning album's better. It's got more consistency it's just this is better produced it's a better sounding record this is a better record for them to do i think um this could have maybe done something for them then you've got breathing down your neck this is a great deep cut so um this is easily the best track on the side too actually it's one of the best tracks on the album i would say after license to kill maybe sinister double um it's got a great mix aim riff so he's using added added knives on this nice stretchy sort of chords really good great solo um, really good tempo and it, it kind of just kicks things up a bit and then it finishes with a classic sort of mid-tempo 12-8 a track called Circle of Fire this is really good again James Neal some stratospheric metal screams on this um, 
Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a good a good record. I put it in my classic album review. It's not a classic, but it's kind of like a cool album from its time. Uh, this album, I think, I'm not sure where it charted on the Billboard charts. I think Malice got a bit of attention, but if the, I wouldn't say they missed the boat. They were kind of in between the next boat taking off to me. That would be the best way to describe it. Um, 87, I mean, I might line break big with pride, but the kind of next band batch of LA, New York, so we've got Winger in 88, Skid Row in 89. Malice were kind of a bit more, if they got, you know, kept the level a bit more down and dirty, they maybe would have been better on the, with the heavier edge that it had to the sound on the back of the Skid Row at that time. You know, you imagine that they did a third album and that, that caught traction. But um, I think by this point, uh, you know, Maiden and Priest were about as heavy as a band was going to get big at that point. Both of those bands had commercialised their sounds in 86 with the Turbo and the Somewhere in Time album. So, you know, it's difficult if you're kind of heavier. Um, obviously, things did get big and heavier with the thrash metal movement when Metallica went big. Um, but that's another level of heavy compared to Malice. So I suppose in that respect, Malice are kind of heavier than the LA type of metal bands, but they're not as heavy as the thrash bands. Again, they're kind of falling in between two posts. Uh, so after this, I can't remember what happens. Uh, I think they did another EP, something like that, they split up, and then they did come back with a different singer, a guy who used to sing for just Vicious Rumours, not Carl, Carl Albert, but um, uh, not quite the same sound about James Neal. Um, but um, yeah, worth checking out, definitely. You know, I give this album, on some days I'm an 8 out of 10, and other days I'm like, it's a 7. We'll give it 7.5 out of 10. It's a good 7.5 out of 10. It's kind of let down by two tracks. Worth checking out. Malice License to Kill. So, Happy New Year. And we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Thanks.